Inbreeding is when two closely related animals a mate that have a common ancestor. Inbreeding can duplicate either good or bad genetic information into the DNA strand, which sometimes can be an improvement. But an example of a defective DNA strand is in the case of spider lambs. Spider lambs will have long twisted legs and this is caused by inbreeding. Another example of the effects of inbreeding is hip dysplasia in German Shepherd dogs. In the 1920s, Hollywood made the German Shepherd breed very popular, and everyone went out to raise as many German Shepherd dogs as they could. The German Shepherd breed became inbred and has been paying for it ever since. If you want a German Shepherd dog that doesn't have hip dysplasia, you have to fly them in from Germany because all of the USA stock has been destroyed through inbreeding. But inbreeding doesn't just destroy the outside appearance of an animal, it also destroys their traits. I believe inbreeding is why many modern sheep breeds uh, no longer are able to lamb on their own. They need assistance in lambing. Uh, the, the mothers don't bond with their, their children like they should. They've also lost their flocking instincts and um, they seem to be more open to infectious diseases. They need constant vaccinations as well as deworming. That's why I raise St. Croix sheep is they don't seem to have these kinds of problems. Apparently they've never been so popular as to become inbred. The St. Croix sheep are just more natural and, um, and need very little attention to raise. I believe the reason they still have these traits is because they have not been inbred. We can learn a lot about how traits are lost uh, through inbreeding by looking at human examples. Charles Darwin married his first cousin, who was Emma Wedgworth. As first cousins, Charles Darwin and Emma, his wife, went on to have ten children. Of these um, ten children, three died before age ten, two died of infectious diseases, and three of the surviving married children produced no offspring at all. So inbreeding can affect your ability to resist disease as well as your ability to reproduce. The Habsburg royal family practiced inbreeding to maintain control over their throne and produced the famous Habsburg jaw, but it also affected their traits. The Habsburg inbreeding is linked to their, their problems with epilepsy, insanity, and early death, and many people believe that's what caused their dynasty to go extinct. King George III was the king of England during the American Revolution and was a product of inbreeding. He was bipolar and would talk nonstop until foam came out of his mouth. His doctors would treat him using straight jackets and ice baths. King Charles III is the current king of England. He is inbred as his parents, who are Elizabeth and Philip, they share common ancestors. His traits speak for themselves. Yet he has no observable defects in his outward body. It's really his traits that are the problem. So a sheep or any other animal can appear normal on the outside, but they're lacking these traits because of inbreeding. So what's a major cause of inbreeding? Is it the size of the flock? Is that the problem? There is a 250-acre island off the coast of Scotland called Soy Island. And on this island, there are soy sheep. They have lived there for hundreds of years. They are apparently brought there by the Vikings, and yet there's no real sign of inbreeding. So why isn't this small, isolated herd of sheep inbred? What, what is the difference? The difference is the soy sheep have a natural sex ratio of one ram for every ewe, which prevents inbreeding. In 1930, the geneticist Ronald Fisher outlined his Fisher Principle, which showed how nature naturally creates a one-to-one -one sex ratio between male and female. Yet, men will take a single superior male and try and breed as many females as possible with a single male. Here's a spreadsheet from the United Kingdom that shows how if you purchase a 600-pound sterling ram, what the cost is going to be to mate with 30, 40, 50, or even 100 ewes. Before we go into what's wrong with this approach, let's take a quick look at the coefficient of inbreeding. 
Wikipedia has a pretty good article on the coefficient of inbreeding, and this is really just the probability that there will be duplicated DNA information that can cause a genetic problem. So breeding a father to a daughter, a mother to a son, or a brother to a sister would be a 25% inbreeding coefficient. Breeding a grandfather to a granddaughter or grandmother to a grandson would be 12.5%. A half-brother to a half-sister would be 12.5%, as well as an uncle to a niece or an aunt to a nephew. Breeding to a first cousin would cause a 6.25% coefficient of inbreeding. And on the right side of the page, the more distant relationships are less than 6.25% coefficient of inbreeding. In the Bible, Leviticus 18, 6 through 18, prohibits the inbreeding of humans uh, up to the first cousin or closer. So with humans, you have to have a coefficient of inbreeding that's less than 6.25%. What's generally acceptable with animals uh, is that anything under 6% coefficient of inbreeding is safe. A moderate amount would be 6 to 10% coefficient of inbreeding. And a very high coefficient of inbreeding is 10% or greater. So while mating first cousins in animals may be somewhat acceptable, um, mating half-siblings is absolutely not. So to illustrate this point, let the blue square A represent a single ram, and the seven pink circles represent seven U's. Now let's say that each U gives birth to twins, a male and a female, with the blue squares being males and the pink circles being females. All of these offspring are half-siblings and share a common parent, which is the, uh, the ram. If all of these offspring are sold for slaughter, then there can never be any type of inbreeding. But if these half-siblings are kept in the flock or, or sold as breeding stock to another farm, that's where the problem starts. If these offspring breed with each other, they create a coefficient of inbreeding of 12.5%, which is very high. So if someone comes to this farm and asks to buy a ram and three ewes and, and, they, and they purchase them, well then when they breed them back on their farm, all their offspring will be somewhat inbred. They can also purchase a brother and sister, which would give it a 25% coefficient of inbreeding. So there's, there's a lot of problems with this, this model. So what happens if there's seven different rams for seven different ewes? So with the blue squares representing the rams and the uh, pink circles representing the ewes. With this setup, every set of twins is genetically diverse from every other set of twins. If ram A1 breeds with any of the other female ewes uh, produced from this that are, that are not his sister, uh, then he will produce offspring that has a zero coefficient of inbreeding. And there is one chance in seven that Ram A1 could breed his own sister if left totally on his own, which would produce a 25% coefficient of inbreeding. But he has six out of seven chances of breeding with uh, a ewe that has that would produce 0% coefficient of inbreeding. This would give us an average of 3.57% coefficient of inbreeding for the flock. Now, if you had a larger flock, and instead of just seven breeding pairs, you had 100 breeding pairs, and they produced 200 offspring, uh, an equal number of males and females, then the chance that any male would breed his own sister would be one chance out of 100 it'd be only a 1% chance. Yet he would have a 99% chance of breeding a female for which he had no genetic relationship with, which would give you a zero coefficient of inbreeding. So where do you find an equal number of males to go with your females? Well, the answer is real simple. It's in your own herd. Um, you, you should keep the same number of males in your herd as females. Well, if they're all from the same herd, then won't they be inbred? No, because after two or three generations removed, uh, inbreeding is not a problem. It's just that they're a very close relative. 
And sheep have a new generation every year, so after two or three years, if they don't breed with a close relative, they're fine. This is what happens on the island of Soy. There's been no new sheep introduced there for like a thousand years, so it's, it's the same DNA genetic material, but there's enough separations through the generations they have, and that protects them from inbreeding. With a new generation produced every year, the odds are that they aren't going to inbreed. It is a gene pool that continually refreshes itself. Each new individual is like a snowflake and provides new diversity that, that keeps it from inbreeding. Well, won't the rams fight each other? Well, not if they're raised together. If they're raised together, they already know the, the pecking order or the dominant structure. And so, no, they, they don't fight. They fight in the beginning, but after a while they know who can beat who and they don't fight anymore. Well, won't one ram uh, be dominant and breed all the other ewes and, and leave the other rams out? A dominant ram will breed more sheep, but you'd be surprised how the other sheep, the other rams can kind of get around a little bit behind his back and do what they got to do too. So you, you still get diversity. And by letting the most dominant ram breed, you're ensuring that his good abilities to reproduce are passed on to your herd. Now compare that to this guy, this, this one prize ram. How do you know he can actually reproduce? He has been chosen entirely on how he looks and not on his interest in reproduction. Also, when you call out all the other males and have a single male for a flock, you're calling out all the other males' genetic material and all their diversity from your flock. Every animal has expressed traits that you can see, or a phenotype, and unexpressed traits like a genotype or the genetic material that's not seen. For example, this male will produce female offspring uh, that will carry his genetic information. Does this male carry the genetic material for good milk production, for being a good mother, for lambing? Well, you don't know because it's a male, but yet it's still got that genetic information inside of it. So your sheep flock carries a lot of genetic information, and you really should be culling from the bottom. That is, you should be culling the animals that are sick or weak or, or, or don't have a, a good shape, and not try to cull all the males except for one out of your flock. And just like this male could be passing on a lot of good traits to your flock, he could have some bad traits as well that just aren't being expressed, that you may find out later. So how am I supposed to be able to afford to carry an equal number of males and females uh, through the winter when I only have hay enough for the females? Well, the answer is you don't have to. St. Croix sheep breed on a yearly cycle, and by October 15th of each year, all the rams have finished doing what they're going to do for that year. In fact, most of them have their work done uh, really by about August 15th. But there are a few late, late lambs that come in later. And so you want to keep all your rams out there until at least um, October 15th. And these are the young rams that were born that year. That's what you want to keep until October 15th. Now, I keep a few of the very best rams for the next year. But I, I call from the bottom. So all the rams that don't look quite as good, by October 15th, they're all sold or slaughtered. When you look at the way nature raises animals in the wild, there's a lot of really good reasons that nature does what it does. So that's, that's what we call natural sheep. Pure sheep would be sheep raised without chemicals, which is also what we do. So pure natural sheep means that they're raised without chemicals and they're raised according to nature. Well, thanks for watching the video.